Hello, and welcome to today's NITSI webinar on teaching collaborative regional planning in gateway and national, um, natural amenity regions. My name is Lisa Patterson, and I'll be your moderator for today. I'm the Tech Transfer and Workforce Development Program Manager for TREC, the Transportation Research and Education Center at Portland State University. TREC houses NITSI, the National Institute for Transportation and Communities. NITSI is the federally designated National University Transportation Center for Livable Communities and is a Portland State-led partnership with the University of Oregon, Oregon Institute of Technology, University of Utah, University of Arizona, and University of Texas at Arlington. Our webinars are based on original research conducted by faculty, researchers, and students at these NITSI partner universities. The goal of the webinar is to get useful research results into the hands of practitioners, academics, and other stakeholders. All right. Our speaker today is Dr. Danya Rumari from University of Utah. Danya is the director of the Environmental Dispute Resolution Program in the Wallace Stegner Center and a research assistant professor in the SJ Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah. She is also a research assistant professor in the University of Utah Department of City and Metropolitan Planning. She teaches courses in negotiation and dispute resolution and is a research affiliate of the University of Utah Center for Ecological Planning and Design and Global Change and Sustainability Center. Danya's work and research focus on supporting collaborative decision making and stakeholder engagement in the context of science intensive environmental issues and complex po public policy changes. She's currently developing an initiative to better understand the unique planning challenges facing small communities in gateway and natural amenity regions in the Mountain West and to provide planning support and capacity building for these regions. All right, before diving into the webinar, I'd like to give you um, an update on our, a few of our upcoming webinars. On May 30th, Arlie Atkins from the University of Arizona will be presenting lessons from recent research on planning for walkable, inclusive communities. And on June 11th, Roger Langren from Oregon Institute for Technology will present on his education research project, First-Hand Data Collection, Students Get Behind the Wheel of Vehicle Dynamics. All right, and one last slide before I hand it over to Danya, um, just to give you an overview of the webinar. Danya will present for about 40 minutes. During this time, you can submit questions, which will be answered at the end of the webinar. We will be recording today's webinar and we'll make it available on our website. You will also receive the video recording and presentation slides in an email following the webinar in the next day or two. If you're tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit, and instructions on how to redeem the credit will also be included in your post-webinar email. During the presentation, as I mentioned, you can submit questions for Dania by using the questions pane on your control panel. We will track the questions, and Dania will respond to them at the end of the webinar. All right, and with that, I will hand it over to Dania to talk about her research. All right, good morning everyone, or good afternoon, depending on how far east you are. Um, thank you for that introduction, Lisa. Today, as Lisa indicated, I'm going to talk about my uh, very academic-y uh, title here, the Tools and Techniques for Teaching Collaborative Regional Planning, Enhancing Livability and Sustainable Transportation in Gateway and Natural Amenity Regions. I also wanna talk a little bit about the work we're continuing to do in these gateway natural amenity regions, and hopefully we'll leave some time for questions so you can, you know, we can talk about whatever's most of interest to folks on, on the webinar. Since I'm going to use the term NAR quite a lot today, NAR communities, I wanted to really explain what that is. So we're all talking about the same thing. Oops, just clicked myself out of presenter mode, just a moment, there we are. So when I say gateway natural amenity region, I'm referring to areas outside of state or national parks, national forests, recreational areas, protected cultural heritage sites, other prominent public lands, and really just the, the areas that rely on natural amenities, whether they be lakes, again, these public lands, for recreation, tourism, leisure, or just where natural amenities make these places generally very desirable areas to live. And again, we really are focused on these regions, recognizing that there are a lot of communities outside of these areas and a lot of different jurisdictions in these regions. And as I'm gonna make the case today, when we think about planning transportation issues around these gateway natural amenity regions, it really is a regional challenge. So NAR communities, especially again, we're focused mainly on the Western United States. NAR communities will probably include some places that you, you know well. Many of you have probably visited Zion National Park, may be familiar with Springdale, small town outside of Zion, areas like Moab, 
Park City, Utah, so some ski areas, places like Aspen in Colorado, Jackson, Wyoming, Telluride, Colorado. But in our communities also include a variety of communities that maybe aren't quite so well known. So places like Escalante or Escalante, depending on who you ask, how to pronounce it, um, in Utah, or Brigham City in Utah, which defines itself as the gateway to the world's greatest wild bird refuge. Places like San Juan County, which really markets its whole county as a kind of a gateway natural amenity region that you might want to come visit, spend some time in. And places like my hometown in northern Idaho, Sandpoint, and the broader region around Sandpoint. So these are the kinds of communities that we're really talking about when we talk about NAR communities. As was noted in my bio, one of my roles here at the University of Utah is as the director of the Environmental Dispute Resolution Program. And our EDR program really focuses on supporting collaboration as a means to address environmental, natural resource, and public policy concerns in the Mountain West. And in light of my training as a planner, I really focus a lot on planning related issues. And again, I'm really focusing on issues in these NAR communities. So a couple of years ago, um, in my EDR program capacity, I was assisting the small town of Rockville, Utah, which is just a few miles outside of Zion National Park in dealing with a variety of community conflicts they were having. For those of you who don't know Rockville, and I'm guessing that's many of you, the town is about 250 people, and it literally is just a couple miles outside of Zion National Park, just on the other side of Springdale, along Highway State Highway 9, which is the main road leading into Zion National Park from the west side. Rockville is a town that really prides itself on its agricultural history and small town field. And the town was really struggling at that time, and I would say continues to struggle with a variety of issues related to regional growth, traffic along SR9, and general concerns about losing its small town agricultural identity in light of the kind of changes that were happening in Zion National Park. And as those of you who might know what's going on in Zion National Park might recognize, the park has over the last couple of years seen what some people call exponential, but definitely considerable increases in park visitation. And these, this increase in park visitation has come with a variety of opportunities for the region, particularly in the form of economic development opportunities. But it's also created a large variety of challenges for the region, including towns like Rockville. For the park, some of those challenges just generally look like crowding, congestion, overuse of resources, overwhelming of the park shuttle system. For towns like Springdale, right outside the park, it, it creates a parking issue. So we have a park with a lot of parking issues, as well as just general congestion, changes to the community character. And again, these effects were spilling over into Rockville, the town just down the road. So again, some of these challenges take the form of, they take and took the form of um, pressure on parking and transportation systems, impacts on other infrastructures, such as restrooms and water treatment facilities in the park and outside of the park, pressure on emergency management and safety services systems. We've heard from folks, you know, what happens if you're in a three mile lineup of cars to get in the park and someone has a heart attack and you can't even get an emergency vehicle to that person. Um, a lot of concerns about affordability of housing for residents and for employees, people who work in the communities outside of Zion National Park rarely can afford to actually live in those communities. Concerns about community character and quality of life in general related to these issues. And we've heard from folks that they can't even get out of their driveway onto the main road because of the lineups of cars. And just general concerns about environmental and recreational amenity degradation. So concerns about degrading the very thing that makes these areas so special. Um, one of the things we realized in working with Rockville and then the other regional stakeholders is that these issues truly are regional, right? The park is a driver of economic development. A lot of people are coming to visit the park. And there's also a lot of BLM land around that area, a lot of other recreational amenities that are drawing people. So the drivers are in some ways regional, even though Zion National Park is the main driver. And the impacts are definitely regional. You've got one main highway going into the park, going out the other side. All of the communities around that highway are being affected. BLM lands are being affected. The park is being affected. You have a lot of county land in the area, so the county is a key stakeholder. Here in Utah, we have the school, uh, CITLA, the School Institute Trust um, Lands Administration, which owns a lot of land as well. So a lot of people who are involved in managing the lands that are both affected and maybe driving some of the, the pressures. So in light of that, we recognized that there was a real opportunity and a need for collaborative planning throughout the region. 
and we helped initiate an organization that's now called the Zion Regional Collaborative, the ZRC. The ZRC is bringing together key regional stakeholders to really try to develop joint strategy to address these regional issues and to proactively plan and to respond to regional challenges. Parties that are currently involved in the ZRC include public officials from multiple municipalities, including Rockville and Springdale, as well as Town of Virgin, Town of Laverkin, Town of Hurricane, representatives from Zion National Park, from the Bureau of Land Management, from multiple counties around the area, from the Utah Office of Tourism, the Utah Office of Outdoor Recreation, from the Utah Office, um, sorry, the Utah Department of Transportation, a number of local businesses, local tourism offices, and others. So as you probably get a sense, a lot of people recognize the challenges, recognize they're being affected, and recognize the need to work together to solve these problems. And the ZRC is really trying, again, to work together to develop joint strategy to address those issues I mentioned before, traffic and congestion, parking issues, impacts on infrastructure and water resources, implications for livability and community character, issues with camping and recreation, and whatever else comes up. And from my experience working with this region for over two years now, there is always something that comes up. They are facing new challenges every day, not to mention record-setting visitation to the park basically every year. So working with the ZRC and through trying to assist regional stakeholders in addressing the challenges they face, um, through that process, my team and I really quickly discovered a few things. And the first is that Zion National Park in that region is not the only region facing these kinds of challenges. We see publications like this here in Utah, the Mighty Five, Wait at the Mighty Five, Utah's National Parks. Park visitation is up throughout Utah and throughout most of the um, Western United States at the big parks, and it's affecting the communities and the regions around the parks seeing that as well up in Montana around Glacier. And it's not just around national parks. We also have a lot of small communities like Canaraville that have, again, these natural amenities outside of their towns, whether the town be 200 people or uh, 1,500 people or 10,000 people, they still have these natural amenities that are drawing visitors. And often the number of visitors exceeds the number of people in the towns. So for example, the town of Springdale outside of Zion hosts what they think about 10,000 people every day. In this town, Canaraville, it's shown in this uh, image here for this news article here, is about 350 to 400 people. And I think they have at least that many, probably a lot more coming through most days during peak season to visit Canaraville Falls. So what we found through, again, our work down in Zion and our continued research and work is that you're really seeing a lot of what we consider big city problems in small rural towns in these NAR areas. Not to mention these NAR areas also have some really unique challenges. So for example, you tend to have these issues of affordable housing in small towns, traffic congestion and parking. We're even having, seeing a lot of concerns about sprawl. But you also have these unique challenges of things such as tensions between newcomers and old timers that are very prevalent and even create you know, shouting matches at public meetings and town halls. We often see very strong and prominent political divides, including between jurisdictions, a lot of the places I work, you have more conservative counties around more liberal municipalities, and they really need to work together to solve the issues they're facing and might have very different perspectives. And not that that's so unique, but it's very prominent in these kinds of areas. People typically consider NAR communities to be very special, right? They're natural amenities, beautiful national parks that make them so special, and they want to keep them special to protect the natural amenities and landscapes and the community character that make them such desirable places to live and visit. But with that, you get this sort of tendency of people who live there want to close the door behind them to not have other people come. And the problem is that people are coming and they're coming in larger masses than they have before. And some of these areas are really facing considerable growth pressures, not just to mention increased visitation. Problematically, a lot of these areas tend to have few professional staff, if any professional staff, especially planners, they often have very small municipal budgets. And largely as a result of that and of the difficult pressures that they're facing, we're finding these places are not well equipped to effectively, not to mention proactively, address the challenges they face from growth and development. Through our work with the Zion region and through our related work, um, we really then identified the need to to better address these issues. And we've also found that there's really not a lot of work going on focused on these, these issues in these communities by planning and transportation scholars. So there's a huge need and not a lot of academic focus on these communities. So we think that we really need to focus on better understanding the planning and transportation challenges in our communities, 
to develop tools to assist these communities in addressing their challenges and opportunities, to help build the capacity of these communities to tackle these challenges and opportunities, and to better train people to go work in these communities, be it graduate students or undergraduate students, or just anybody who really has an interest in being a planner, a public official, a community leader in our community. So from all of that, we built this idea of what we're now calling the NAR Initiative, which will be based here at the University of Utah, but we're intending it to be a broad partnership with anybody who has an interest in these kinds of communities. And the broad idea behind this NAR Initiative is to provide research, education, and capacity building aimed at understanding and addressing the planning, transportation, and other community development challenges in NAR communities throughout the Western United States. With support from a curricula development grant from NITSI, this idea really got off the ground um, via a student workshop course back in fall 2016. So it was sort of an idea we were starting to brew on from our work in the Zion region and our NITSI grant back in 2016 to do some curricula work around this really helped us flesh out this idea. So with that support from NITSI, we held a graduate student workshop course back in fall 2016, really focused on the Zion region and I'm trying to, to understand the challenges going on there and what's going on in other NAR communities and to use that knowledge to develop a series of tools and resources to help students, such as those in planning and transportation programs, learn about regional collaborative planning and the transportation and planning challenges in NAR communities. The products of that, um, the students participated in the Zion Regional Collaborative. They helped facilitate small groups in that collaborative and they really got to observe and learn how regional collaborative planning is done. They developed a variety of reflections on that and lessons learned. And from their reflections and lessons learned from that real world experience as well as background research, they developed a variety of teaching objectives that they thought were relevant for students who want to understand these communities and be able to effectively work in these communities. Those teaching objectives are captured in our final project report for that curricula grant, which is I believe now online. We also, during that fall workshop course, developed a series of scenarios that can help students play with these ideas and concepts. So we identified the teaching objectives we think they need to learn about, and then we developed some scenarios to help them actually play with those ideas. And these are some snippets from those written scenarios, which are usually in the form of, imagine you are this person trying to work in this kind of community in this kind of way, consider these kinds of things. And these scenarios are really useful for integrating into any class, it can be a planning class, it can be a negotiation class, but you can take these scenarios, give it to students who can get in small groups, talk through the scenario, and really try to put themselves in the shoes of a planner in a community or a facilitator trying to work with the community. So we have these, um, these scenarios, a couple of them I believe are shared in our final report, and all of these materials will be made online on our online toolkit, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Through that graduate student workshop class in fall 2016, we also started to really compile resources we thought would be helpful for NAR communities and to really flesh out the ideas of this initiative that we recognize would need to focus on research, education, and capacity building, but we didn't quite know what it needed to look like. So we started to flesh that out. And we really developed this idea for an online toolkit that could be helpful for folks wanting to work with these communities, train people to work in these communities, and generally for these communities. The work the graduate students during that workshop course as well as our further exploration of existing literature and additional research really confirmed our suspicion that there is not enough academic attention being paid to these particular kinds of communities and that we really need to be studying them and better understanding their challenges and opportunities so we can better help them. So we applied for another NITSI grant and this time for a general research grant. And we were very appreciative that NITSI was willing to support this work. And our work and our aim in undertaking this research was really to generate an empirical evidence base around the kinds of challenges being faced in these communities. We were observing it. We had a lot of an anecdotal evidence to suggest there were a certain suite of issues, these big city challenges being faced by these small communities. And there really wasn't a lot of empirical evidence beyond those observations to lean on. So again, our goal in undertaking this first step of research was really just to better document and rigorously understand those issues. We also really wanted to continue to add to that, that objective of research, education, and capacity building through doing this research. So to talk through some of the steps in this most recent um, research approach that we're taking, the actual research elements of it 
relied initially on developing a database of NAR communities in the Western United States. What are these communities? Again, we have a general sense of the typology, but how many of them are there? Are most of them developed? Are many of them undeveloped? So we used a variety of GIS tools to really build a database of, of the communities that fit the bill of a NAR community in the Western United States. We then selected approximately 20 NAR communities that um, spanned the gamut from not very developed, not a lot of tourism or growth action to places like Moab that are quite far developed. And we conducted interviews with public officials in those communities. And from the findings of that, those interviews, which we've recently completed, we are developing a survey which will go out to the approximately 900 NAR communities we've identified in the Mountain West. And this survey will really help us to explore the generalizability of some of our findings from the interviews, further explore some of those findings, learn a little bit more, and continue to compile an idea of what would be helpful to these communities. And I'll talk a little bit um, towards the end of this webinar about some of the preliminary findings from our interviews. In terms of education, we want to continue to host our NAR Community Planning Workshop course, so that workshop course that we're doing with graduate students. And through hosting that course, we're really engaging graduate students in developing tools and resources to help NAR communities. We also here at the University of Utah and our city metropolitan planning department recognize that there are no other planning departments that are really focusing on NAR communities, or at least we haven't found them. And we have a specialization in small town and resort town planning here. And we really want to continue to develop that, recognizing that as these communities face additional visitation and growth pressures, they are going to need planning expertise, particularly people who really understand the challenges in these communities and have the skill set to work in these communities. And we're continuing to really focus on capacity building. I'm a very applied person. I do a lot of what we call outward facing work here at the university, really trying to help communities. So this capacity building piece is very near and dear to my heart. We really want this research to help us understand what's going on and then to respond in terms of developing tools and resources. So some of the ways we're doing that are we are continuing to facilitate and support the Zion Regional Collaborative. Um, through our work with the Zion Regional Collaborative, we were actually approached by colleagues of mine up in North Idaho who said they were having similar issues, really needed to be doing regional planning. And from that, we helped catalyze an organization called the Bonner Regional Team around Sandpoint, Idaho which is a similarly a regional collaborative planning effort. And through facilitating those, engaging students in those efforts, we are both allowing students to really see this work done on the ground. And we're really trying to develop lessons learned that we can use for other places through these more in-depth case, case studies and interactions with a couple NAR regions. We're also continuing to move forward with developing tools and resources for the online NAR community toolkit, as I mentioned before. One of the key ways we wanna do that is through having students develop those tools and resources. It's obviously an amazing learning opportunity for them to do the research, to observe, to make calls to folks in our communities to better understand their needs. So we are continuing to do that. And we have started to partner with the Utah Rural Planning Group to really build out that online toolkit. And I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end as well. And then we're really continuing to just explore ways we can partner with other people to expand our capacity, to really expand the capacity being um, provided to these communities. So we've been in conversations with folks like the Utah chapter of APA, the National Park, Park Conservation Association, the National Park Service Rivers, Trails and Conservation Assistance Program, and a variety of other organizations that have an interest in national parks, big public lands, and the communities around them to look at opportunities of working together to host trainings, to provide peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities for folks in our communities, and just generally to support research sharing. And I would very much um, like to be able to present on our findings from the research we're currently doing, the interviews, the survey, in about a year, once we actually have all that data in and we've, we've actually analyzed it. Um, but I thought it might be interesting to share some of our very preliminary findings with you all today. So some of the things we have learned from these interviews with folks in over 20 NAR communities throughout the Mountain West, and again, they're across kind of a, a range of development, is that in the places that are more developed in terms of their visitation and growth pressures, we're seeing pretty extraordinary transportation and housing affordability issues. And a place like Zion is kind of the icon for this in terms of having three mile lineups of cars, a place where the folks who work there, even the public officials, cannot afford to live in the town, 
but we're seeing some version of that in pretty much all developed NAR communities. And I'm seeing this up in my hometown of Sandpoint, Idaho. We also are noting that Western NAR communities appear to follow a relatively similar, similar development trajectory. I mean, they all have their own pathways, but you see a certain trajectory of once they get discovered, there seems to be a trajectory they get on. And at first, the, the tourism, the money that comes with it's really desirable, that's great. And then it starts to become more of a nuisance. And then it's they've got these housing issues and they've got transportation issues. And there's a lot of things they wish they had planned for previously. And so we're starting to see that. I can't say that we fully understand it. Some of this has been documented in tourism literature elsewhere, but we don't feel it quite captures what we're seeing, especially because it's not just about tourism. In a place like Northern Idaho, a lot of this pressure really is development pressure, it's growth, it's people who want to move there. And I don't think we fully understand that and nor do we fully understand how to help communities get out ahead of it if they want to. So this is something we've, uh, we've identified, we need to better look into it to really understand what's going on. And then we're just consistently hearing that folks are overwhelmed, they don't feel they have the tools and resources they need to deal with the pressures they face, their community doesn't have the um, staff and the training to deal with the kind of pressures they face. And so I think our research thus far has really reinforced our suspicion that there is a need for additional tools, resources, and capacity building, which is why we really are going to continue to double down on trying to provide that through our future research and work. So just to talk a little bit about the online toolkit I've mentioned, we were hoping to, I think, launch this a year ago and then realize these things really take time. And I'm a, a huge believer in going slow to go fast. We really want to do this right and things do move slower in academia than I'd like, so we're just gonna take our time to do what we need to do. Um, at this point though, we have a URL set up, we've got a web platform, we've created this partnership with the Rural Planning Group who's very skilled at developing online toolkits and resources, and we're really thrilled about that partnership since this is their area of expertise. And we've got a number of tools. And the structure of the toolkit will look something like this. This is our sort of skeleton site right now. And as you can see along the top, we'll have a set of issues that the, the toolkit addresses. We'll share some approaches. We'll find a way to share experiences from across communities. And we're looking into things such as, do we host a blog where different communities such as Sandpoint or Springdale or Rockville or Moab can share their stories? So we're still exploring what exactly this will look like, but the structure will generally be something like this. And for each area of issue, which you can see is open on the screenshot I have here, We'll have a, a home page which talks about this key issue, such as growth management and land use planning. And while this is just a key planning issue for any community, what we are finding is a lot of these NAR communities all of a sudden get hit with a lot of development. And again, a lot of them don't even have trained professional planners. And in a lot of these places, if you say growth management or you say land use planning, that might be a bad word. So what we're trying to do is provide tools and resources that can help communities get beyond whether this is even something they can talk about to this is something you need to be talking about and giving them resources through which to do that. So for each of the issues, you'll have a home page like this. It'll have a bit of an explanation of the issue. It'll also share resources that other organizations have developed that are relevant to this issue. So for example, this one pulls a Lincoln Institute of Land Policy focus report on arrested developments which have also been called, I believe, like ghost town developments. But we've seen in some of these areas, they rapidly develop and then the growth pressure's off. And now you have a bunch of basically suburbs that nobody wants to live in, which become a liability for the town. So the Lincoln Institute produced some, a report on that. Those are the kinds of things we will share just so communities can proactively think about the risks of development, ways to get ahead of it. So that's along the right there. And then we are also developing case studies for each of these issues. This one on growth management and land use planning shares a case study from Park City here in Utah, which has been very proactive in trying to use a variety of tools to manage growth and do wise land use planning, protect their open spaces. And this also has a case study from Bear Lake Valley, which is in Utah and Idaho, talking about how they tried to use scenario planning to inform their growth and land use decisions. So for each of the issues that we've got covered and we'll continue to add more issues and more resources, the idea is to share resources other people have developed and then to fill in the gaps by developing additional resources and tools as need be. Just to give an example, one of the things that will be covered is dark skies and efforts to protect dark skies, which is a very significant issue, both um, kind of community character wise and also in terms of economic development for a lot of these in our regions. 
the Rural Planning Group has developed a beautiful guide and best practices document, document on dark skies planning. So we're gonna share that through the toolkit. They've developed it, we would just wanna share it and get it out to communities that might want it. We're not finding a lot of stuff on short-term rentals, and we know this is a huge issue in a lot of these NAR regions. So we've developed a case study and we'll develop some more tools to fill in those gaps. And again, that's the kind of material that will be on this toolkit. Our hope is that the toolkit will be officially launched this fall. We'll probably do a soft launch more over the summer and really continue to refine it. It'll be at um, the web address nar.utah.edu. If you go there right now, you will get a, this page is not live note. Um, so we'll make sure to send out a notice once it actually goes live, but the aim is to have it all officially up and running and beautified by this fall. In the meantime, or down the line, if you have questions or ideas, or you think this is great and you really want to be part of making it happen, you can contact us at nar at utah.edu. Um, I'll also have my email address at the end of this webinar so you can contact me directly. So we've done a lot of stuff over the last little bit and we've really tried again to focus on the research, the education, the capacity building at any point in time, depending on the projects we have going on, the grants that we're bringing in, we may be focusing more on one or the other. We're really thrilled to have support from NITSI to really drive hope for the research element because we are big believers in connecting theory to practice. And I think we really need to better understand these communities before we can fully understand how to educate people to work in them and before we can effectively build capacity. The neat thing is that through all of this work that we've really had some great broader impacts. And again, I'm a more of an outward facing academic, so I'm a big fan of broader impacts. And some of the things that stand out to me is over really the two years that we've been focusing on this, we funded and engaged more than 12 graduate students, a number of whom have already graduated and now have gotten jobs as public officials in our communities, such as one student who graduated last year and is now a transportation planner in the city of Bend, Oregon which once was a small city and is no longer a small city. Through this work, we've also leveraged well more than $300,000 worth of grants and gifts, not to mention a lot more in-kind support. And from my quick back of the envelope calculation, that's come from more than 10, resource, 10 sources. And those sources range from NITSI to the Utah Office of Tourism to even the National Association of Realtors, who gave us a smart growth grant for our work up in North Idaho. And one of the most impactful things I think in light of the work that I do is we've catalyzed and supported two ongoing regional collaborative planning efforts in NARS. So the Zion Regional Collaborative, which I mentioned, and the Bonner Regional Team we now have going up in North Idaho. It's also worth noting that we've had a lot of fun along the way. It's not hard to recruit graduate students to work in NAR communities. They like going to Zion, they like going to Bryce. Um, but we do try to make it a lot of fun. And again, these are very special regions we get to work in. And we really try to make sure that the students get to gain that appreciation because they may go and be planners in these communities. And I want them to have an in-depth appreciation for these kinds of places. So the gnarly road ahead, we're getting a lot of mileage out of the, the acronym NAR. Um, some next steps. As we expected, our work thus far has probably opened up more questions and opportunities than we've resolved things or gotten you know, the clear answers. And that's great. And this is a kind of an open playing field we're realizing and we just wanna to continue to explore. So what that means for us in terms of research, through our interviews, as I noted, we've consistently heard that there are critical issues in developing our communities around transportation, things related to congestion, parking, mobility in general, and that housing affordability and workforce housing are key issues. And we're finding that transportation and housing and other land use issues are integrally tied. So we anticipate digging much deeper into those issues and the nexus between them, such as through doing a number of in-depth case studies. So starting to look a lot deeper at the, tra the trajectories these communities have followed, their transportation interventions, their transportation plans, how that's working out for them. Have any places been able to get out ahead of this? How so? What might other communities learn from that? And our hope is really just to better understand the transportation challenges and then to help um, put forward innovation, innovative strategies and proactive strategies for places that are on the upswing in terms of their development. As part of that, we, as I noted before, recognize there's a need to better understand this pattern of, of development, this trajectory these communities are experiencing and to document that. Because I know from working here in Utah, you have places such as the communities outside of Capitol Reef National Park which historically was kind of a sleepy wilderness park, but is increasingly being discovered, those communities are feeling that pressure 
I've heard from folks in Wayne County outside of the park that they don't have the infrastructure to deal with the garbage that is being generated by visitors. So they've got some issues and it's they can see the writing on the wall of this is an issue we're gonna have to deal with, but they don't even know what that means. So we're hoping through doing some of these in-depth case studies, we can better provide resources to those places that have an opportunity to get ahead of the, the planning and transportation issues. We also just want to generally explore the barriers and opportunities for addressing transportation related issues in our communities. And again, illuminate those lessons that will be helpful to other communities. And through all of that, we're going to continue to take what we learn and develop new tools and resources for the online toolkit. We also want to continue to teach our NAR workshop course here and to engage students in developing those tools and resources. And in terms of capacity building, we plan on continuing to facilitate and engage students in the Zion Regional Collaborative and the Bonner Regional team. If there are opportunities to create additional regional collaborative planning efforts, we would love to catalyze those. And we, could, as I noted, want to launch the online toolkit this fall. And we're really going to start focusing on moving forward with peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities from people from NAR communities. We're hearing that's something they very much want. Moving forward with professional trainings, networking opportunities and just generally partnering with other organizations that are interested in these communities and want to be helpful in trying to meet the need. So our hope is to really build and formally launch this NARA initiative and all those parts of it this fall and going into next year. So hopefully you'll be hearing more about that as the fall rolls around. In conclusion, I really just want to emphasize on this call to all the people who are on the call. I know you come from a lot of different organizations, regions of the country, uh, I, do sh I should say NAR communities are facing a lot of issues, particularly here in the West, but there are NAR communities, gateway natural amenity communities throughout the United States. And I think there might be similar patterns elsewhere. So maybe that's something somebody else can study. Um, but I do think there's an opportunity to help these communities throughout the country. But regardless of what region we're talking about, I really think we need to be paying more attention to these communities. This is where some of the predominant growth is happening, again, at least here in the Mountain West, maybe elsewhere. And these communities have a lot to lose. So I want us to get ahead of it. I want us to help them in preserving the things that make them special. And I hope you all can be part of that endeavor. I want to thank NITSI on behalf of myself, on behalf of my much broader research team, on behalf of the many graduate students and the many communities that have benefited from the funding from NITSI and all the other funding we've been able to leverage as a result of NITSI's funding. NITSI's in a pretty cool position of being able to say they're leading the way in trying to understand, address, and draw attention to planning and transportation challenges in our communities. And we've spent a lot of time trying to understand who's working in this area, and there's not a lot. And if people on the, the call know of uh, other things that we should be aware of, let us know. But from our research, really, NITSI is one of the few organizations funding some of the, the little bit of research that's really focused on these communities. I also just want to take this opportunity to recognize that there are a lot of other people making this possible, including, as I noted, a variety of other funding organizations. I won't list them all here, but I do just want to thank all of those cost match partners, the other folks who have given grants and gifts to make this work possible. And again, my, my broader research team, been more than 12 graduate students um, working with Philip Stoker from University of Arizona on this current research. So lots of other people making this possible. And I should note, and I want to give credit to Zachariah Levine, one of my PhD students, as well as Zion National Park, um, partners in the Zion region for the many photos that I've used throughout this presentation. So with that, as I hoped, I'm going to wrap up on the earlier side. And I would just love to hear what's of interest to people and have a chance to respond to the things that are most interesting to the people on the call. So I'll pass it on to you, Lisa, to let me know what people are asking. Great. Thank you, Dania. That was a very interesting um, presentation. For those viewing the webinar, please feel free to continue to submit your questions if you have them. Um, it does look like we have some great questions already lined up, though. I'll start off with um, kind of a lighter, fun <laughs> question. Um, some uh, viewer has asked, are you aware that NAR is a slang term, short for gnarly, used in NAR communities by ski bumps, climbers, etc.? Was this acronym intentional? Yes and yes. Um, so I'm a skier and biker myself, and we we just were thinking of, we've spent a lot of time thinking, gosh, how do we even talk about these communities? And actually, we spent a lot of time to be a little more serious thinking about what is it that defines the kind of communities we are thinking about. And um, when we talk more about our research next year, we'll spend a lot of time talking about the process we went through to develop the debate database we have 
But what we, again, uh, concluded is that they tend to be in these gateway areas to big public lands, recreation opportunities, that their economies and di desirability are really based on the natural amenities. And originally we thought we wouldn't include ski areas, but I think we realized that not only are they ski areas, but they tend to abut these um, big public lands. And so what we came around to is, well, you know, they're all kind of united by these themes and what would be a good acronym? And through playing around with the letters, we actually came up with the G-N-A-R. And we're like, well, NAR is definitely a term that these you tend to hear in these communities. And we always like to joke about we can tell students to come study the NAR. Um, so we tend to have a lot of fun with it. So I appreciate that comment. And yes, it was very intentional. And we hope it doesn't backfire on us. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's always, that's always nice to have a little fun with that. All right, um, and so the next couple questions are related, so I'll read them both and then um, I'll let you respond how mm -hmm. you see fit. Um, so what are ways in which state and federal governments assist NARA local governments? And then a budget-related question with a lack of big budget uh, developers, how can NARA local governments redevelop and revitalize? All right, so there's a lot embedded in those different questions and they are, they are similar, but they're different. So I'm going to tackle the first one and, and Lisa, I might have you re mm -hmm. say the sec second one just to make sure I hit it spot on. Um, but for now to, to tackle that sort of how do state and other governments help these, these communities and what role do they play? I mean, it obviously depends. It really depends on the region. Part of the reason we got involved down the Zion national park area is there's this thing called Zion nice. Everyone talks about Zion nice. We're so nice to each other. What we found in working with folks down there, though, is that there was a lot of talking and not a lot of truly working together to support each other. And frankly, a lot of sort of latent tension. And it's, it's still ongoing. It's part of why I'm still down there as a neutral facilitator trying to really help folks work together. And it's taken us two years to really get people into the room recognizing we can't all be doing our individual things to solve the problem. We need to be working together to solve the problem. And frankly, sometimes that means not doing exactly what I, the county, or I, the town of Springdale, or I, the national park, want to do on my own. So I think even in places like Zion where there was, there's sort of a desire to help each other, what that actually looks like and getting to the point that you're actually collaborating versus, well, we're, we're doing some stuff to help the other people, but maybe it's not what they most need. That takes a change of heart and mind. And then this is just true in general. This is why I have a job as a facilitator. So I think that's one thing we've found is even in areas where there's intention, it's not always being done as effectively as it could be. And that's true for, say, the more local entities and also the state entities. The example from the design collaborative more statewide is that the state office of tourism launched their Mighty Five campaign, a very, like people call it, wildly successful marketing campaign internationally, nationally, to attract people to Utah's five national parks. If you don't know, we have five national parks. They're all beautiful. And the marketing campaign, as I said, was wildly successful. And all of a sudden, the parks were flooded with people, as were the communities around them. And the national parks and the communities around them had not heard of this marketing campaign prior to being really flooded with people. And I don't think the Office of Tourism meant to do that. I know they didn't mean to. And they were very apologetic when the community started saying, oh my gosh, we are so not ready for this. And their attempt to help was to create a new campaign called the Road to Mighty. So now they're pushing people to the communities between the national parks, lots of other NAR communities that are more natural amenity than say gateway communities. And again, they're good intentions. The challenge is some of these communities really don't want more people. Right? So there's this desire to help, but often there's a breakdown of communication and we do what we think is best for others and then we can actually kick the can down the road or cause more problems. So we've seen all of that play out in the Zion region where there's a desire to help. So the interaction between other local governments, say like counties, um, even just between the municipalities and between the states and the municipalities can take a lot of different forms. And even when there's a good desire to help and intention to help and resources, sometimes that misses the mark. And that's why I've really emphasized regional planning and why we kind of see, we need to talk about gateway natural amenity regions, not just gateway and natural amenity communities, right? The, the, the acronym is NAR, just, not just for fun, but because it matters, it's not NAC. It's not gateway natural amenity community because in some ways these communities can't do their work on their own. And um, up in North Idaho, in my collaborative there, we have a different dynamic where part of the reason that collaborative was started is because there was considerable tension between 
the communities. So you have four, for four more urban areas, they're all less than 10,000 people right against each other, surrounded by county land. Everyone had a different vision of what they wanna be as a community and a region. Everybody's proceeding with their own land use planning. All of a sudden you're looking at a huge potential of sprawl when the city of Sandpoint is doing everything it can to keep from sprawling. Um, all of a sudden the wastewater treatment requirements were being changed. It's just a lot of stuff was happening because everybody was acting on their own, trying to pursue their own interests. And in the midst of that, that area was facing a huge risk of just unmanaged growth and nobody wants that. And that's frankly what we got them together on was nobody wants this area to grow without managing that. Nobody wants the lake to be polluted so that we don't want to live here. So how are we going to work together to prevent that? Because if you're all doing your own thing, it's not working. Um, so just to say there that there was actually very explicit tension between the county and the cities and between the cities. The state's not quite so involved there because it's not like a state tourism effort that's driving the impact. But there are going to be places where not only is there not a lot of help, but there's actually explicit conflict among the different entities. And that makes it really hard to be proactive in your planning. And that's one of those unique challenges that I was getting at. And I think we want to explore that a lot more and see how prevalent that is. Because if it is a, a dominant issue, we need to find ways to get these different stakeholders working together. Because without doing that, City of Sandpoint can't really manage its growth when the land around the the city is the county and the county's letting sprawl happen, say for example. So that's kind of a long-winded answer to that. I hope it hits the intention of that question, um, but it is something I think we want to explore more and we want to find ways to get people on board with helping each other across those scales of government. So Lisa, the second question you asked was more about um, funding and resources. Would you repeat that just so I'm... Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so with the lack of big budget developers, mm -hmm. how can our local governments redevelop and revitalize? Mm. So that's an interesting question again, because this is part of where there is a lot of diversity among these NAR communities. And you're going to have places like Springdale, where you say redevelop, and they're like, what are you talking about? We are just developing. No more development is what a lot of those communities or members want. Like I've, I've actually facilitated conversations about how do we just stop the hotel development? We don't want any more. That's what you hear from community members. Um, so in some places, this whole idea of redeveloping is, is not a thing. It's really how do you stop the development is, at least for some community members, is the real concern. And then there are going to be communities where they're a bit downtrodden, frankly, right? And they maybe don't have much economic activity and they are surrounded by beautiful public lands and resources and things that could attract people. And what we often find in those areas, at least in this part of the country, and this may not be so true elsewhere, is there's a real resistance to a tourism-based economy. And frankly, that's not so misguided. Tourism-based economies co come with a lot of problems, but there is a reticence to even leverage that external resource for more recreation tourism-based um, funding. And instead, some of these areas are really trying to lean still on their historical, more resource extraction based economies, or they're kind of drying up or some combination of the both. And I think we need to recognize that there is a cultural tension between the folks who live in some of these communities and this idea that they could become a recreation, tourism, more traditional development in our community, and they may not want to. And I don't have an answer for what you do about that right now. I think it takes a lot of work with those communities to help them figure out. I mean, in some ways, it's the same planning stuff. What do you want to be? What's your vision? Let's really talk about what the options are. Let's talk about the pros and cons of different development trajectories. Here in Utah, I think that a lot of those places, if they wanted to become more developed tourist areas, would have a lot of support from the state in building that economy. And that could be leveraged to help them redevelop. It would come with a lot of other costs, though. It might come with the challenges that places like Moab and Springdale are dealing with. So at least here in Utah, the, there is a potential opportunity to leverage this more traditional trajectory to help with redeveloping, but then you get into the no more development worry. And again, we don't know how to capitalize on the opportunities and manage the challenges in such a way that we would recommend to a community, you know, this is a good path to go and you can manage the risks. All I can say at this point is that in a lot of these places, at least for right now, that is an option. In areas that really don't, for some reason don't, you know, they have the natural amenities, they are a gateway, but they're just not a desirable place to visit or live. I'm not entirely sure what the opportunities for redevelopment are. 
And I suspect they are there. And maybe that's, again, someplace that we really need to be talking with our states and our counties to figure out what that looks like. But I think that's something that deserves a lot more consideration and in areas outside of the particularly Mountain West might be a lot more of an issue. So that's a whole other topic and I don't have a good answer for that right now. Great. Yeah, and this this next question is related and it, I think you touched on um, some of these strategies in, in your response to the previous question. Um, but we have a, a viewer that asks, they um, state, I've noticed particularly in Zion that a lot of the adjacent communities are excited about the economic impacts of the increase in visitors at Zion and are working hard to accommodate that growth. However, the Park Service, on the other hand, is trying to curtail the growth to achieve their mission of preserving the spaces. Mm -hmm. Do you have specific strategies to reconcile this difference in attitudes regarding growth? Mm -hmm. No, that's a really great question. And I would say in some ways that's a, another reason that the regional planning is so important. Because I think these these regions tend to have very people within them, stakeholders within them, jurisdictions within them that are affect them have very different visions for these places. And I can say that it's an oversimplification to say that, and not that the viewer meant it this way, but just I don't want anyone to be misled to think that the communities outside of Zion all want this development, or even that people within a community are pretty united in their desire for the development. I think there are a lot of people who recognize the benefits that the development has brought. And even the town of Rockville, that which has no commercial development, would like no commercial, and frankly, a lot of those people would like no one to ever drive through their town. Even they will come around to recognize they benefit from the infrastructure in next door Springdale, which has been funded by the visitors. So I think people recognize the benefits, but they feel very differently about, have we gone too far? Can we tailor it back? Is there some way I can protect my community from it? So there's diversity there. And then there's a huge disconnect in some ways from the folks who are economically benefiting outside of the park and what's going on inside of the park. And there tends to be maybe a lack of compassion both directions in terms of the park's got a number of mandates that they are constrained by, they have to fulfill. They're in the process right now of their visit use management planning process, which is very constrained by federal mandate. Funding for the park service is down and for Zion National Park and other parks is down at the same time as their visitation is up. Um, a lot of parks, not so much in Zion, but a lot of other parks have a huge leadership deficit right now, maybe as a result of some of the political shifts, people have left superintendent roles, leadership roles, places like Yosemite, big parks have had acting folks in their leadership roles for a long time. And it's very hard to get ahead of issues and manage issues when you have leadership deficits or just people in roles of authority deficits, when you have a budget deficit, basically, and you've got a lot of red tape you have to jump through and deal with. And so the park's got its own very important and difficult challenges, which does not mean it can't work with the external communities and Zion is really trying. It just means it's very hard for them to even deal with things within the park. So that that, that disconnect, those challenges are very real. They're not gonna go away. And what we really need to do is find a way to balance these things across the different jurisdictions across the region. And again, it's just all, all the more reason why we're really hammering the, you have to be thinking about this regionally. It's a core re reason for why we've brought together the Zion Regional Collaborative. Jeff Brady Baugh, the superintendent of Zion is an active part of that, our, as are the public officials of the communities that are benefiting from economic development. And part of their job is to work through how can we work together regionally in a way that allows us to continue to benefit from the economic development but also not be totally overridden in our towns. And that takes into account the fact that the park does have certain limits. You know, they're very worried in the park that they're well over their carrying capacity as a park in terms of visitor numbers for being able to fulfill their, their mission to protect that space for future generations. You know, and if we can get together and talk through those things, then we can develop some innovative strategies. It doesn't mean the region can't handle more people, but maybe the park is full. I don't know. I'm not going to make any judgment on that, but maybe the park truly can't handle more visitors and maintain its commitment to the public. So can we explore ways of more effectively dispersing people onto BLM land, which is multi-use, is designed in a whole, to be a whole different kind of land? Can we spread people throughout the region? How do we do that together? Because Zion's not going to do it by themselves. And if you leave it to the tourism offices, they may not know where to really direct people. So how do we work together to figure out what areas can handle more people? So people can come and stay in our, our region and leave their money here, 
and not necessarily destroy this thing next door, the park that's making it all so special. You know, those are the kind of conversations these regions need to have. And the re conversation that the Zion region needs to have is different from the conversation the Bonner County Sandpoint region in North Idaho needs to have. But they both need to have those re conversations and they need to have those difficult conversations with all the key jurisdictions and entities from the region there because no one party can solve these problems by themselves and no one party has the great innovation solu innovative solutions or the resources to really do things that can make change. So I think the key part of it is, is recognizing the need to get people into the room together to supporting effective dialogue that really is interest-based, where we recognize the park's not just trying to be a jerk, right? They have key interests and mandates they're trying to uphold. And the, the communities are not just trying to be mean to the parks, right? They they're all have their interests they're trying to achieve. How can we work together to achieve those interests? We need to have those conversations and we need to be not afraid to have the difficult conversations, but we need to have them productively. And I think that's really gonna be at the core for all these areas in terms of, of resolving these issues. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Um, another question from a viewer. Uh, will your efforts look at larger communities within our region as that region grows towards MPO size? Um, this viewer specifically is from Bozeman. And as, um, mm -hmm. as they grow towards MPO size, will they, reach, will they reach to Yellowstone? And would there be fun, federal funding to expand that far? Fascinating. Um, so yeah, Bozeman is another great case study. Bozeman, Bend are some of these places that were small towns not too long ago. And my, my family has personal relationships with both of those communities. And folks in Sandpoint will often say, we don't want to become Bozeman. <laughs> At the same time as Bozeman and Sandpoint will have like competitions about who's the coolest community. Um, so places like Bozeman and Bend are really important learning opportunities. And I think there's some great things that have happened in both of those places and they're really thriving, quote unquote, urban areas now in a lot of ways. And there may be some things that people don't think are so great. And maybe there's different perspectives on that. We are personally right now not looking predominantly at those places. We set our cap at 25,000 as a um, population for our communities, at least for our study. And we excluded any area that's in a MPO. I believe that's the right criteria. And again, when we come out with all of our research, that will all be more documented and we'll explain why we did that. But for the sake of this conversation, right now we're particularly interested in these small places that haven't already gotten past the threshold and seeing if we can help them, not necessarily not grow. I mean, that's not that growth is bad, but just do so in a way that protects the things that make these places special. And maybe there are some good lessons to be learned from places like Bozeman and Bend, either in terms of the challenges they face, they don't feel they got ahead of, or the things that they did they think were successful. And I would say as we go into our next phase of research, we'll, we're definitely gonna look at the places that have kind of gone over the threshold we're using and see what we can learn from them because there's definitely a lot to be learned. Um, I don't know if I can really speak to the, you know, is there the potential to grow up against the park? Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people and I would, putting my personal cards on the table, I'd say I, I hope that doesn't happen. At some point the growth has to stop. Um, there's all, there's a real risk actually that some of these places will deflate. You know, they've been, there's been such fast growth, who knows what's going to happen. So I don't know. Um, I don't know what that would look like, but it is something that frankly, public land managers are going to have to grapple with. You know, they may have urban areas abutting their property and that just wasn't an issue in the past. And so it's, it's something, again, we need to proactively think about. I don't know what it looks like or how we address it, but we should all be thinking about it. And hopefully there are folks on this call who who can start to look into some of those questions. Great. All right, and it looks like we have time for one more question. And I think this will be a good way to wrap up the webinar as you look into your next steps and um, finishing your research. But how do you plan to connect NAR community leaders and citizens to your research and work? And you had touched on your website. Are, are there other um, tools and, and ways that you're gonna connect with the community? Yeah, so the question was to connect community leaders and who? Citizens to your research. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, part of it is like we are we're researching with them in a lot of ways. So when we go down to Zion, they know that they're one of our case studies. They know that we're trying to help understand what's going on there and help them address it. And um, they are kind of along for the ride and they provided a lot of the cost match for the NITSI grants because they think it's really important. So in that way, they're, they're inherently engaged. Um, our next step in build, really building our initiative is to put together a steering committee 
because we really don't want this just to be the University of Utah. We don't want it just to be our city metropolitan planning department. We want it to be cross-disciplinary and, and inside the ac academy and elsewhere, not to mention having other universities. So we want to put together a steering committee that has some of those local folks, as well as people from state offices and whoever else we think really has a good idea of what's going on to help inform the general trajectory of the initiative. And the research we're doing with these community partners right now, or just talking to them about their challenges is really helping to inform the questions that we're gonna get at going forward. And we'll continue to consult with them on how could we best study this and what information is most useful to you. So there's gonna be just a lot of ongoing interaction and that blend between research, education and capacity building kind of keeps it inherently connected. Um, but we always welcome other ways of engaging and making sure that the work we're doing is really helping folks. So if anybody has ideas, feel free to send me a note. I just noticed on my last slide that my email is missing the R in my last name. So <laughs> we'll make sure you have the right email address. Um, but I think with that, I'll pass it to, to Lisa to close off and, and anyone is welcome to contact me for more information. Great. Well, thank you again, Dania, for sharing your work. Um, and thank, every, thank you everyone for joining us today. Here's the link where um, you can download the education project that uh, Dania mentioned. Uh, earlier in her presentation, and you can also view our other upcoming professional develop offerings on our website. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and look forward to that post-webinar email with the recording and slides. Thank you.